Welcome back, everyone, to Furthering Christendom. I am your co-host, Mike DeVito, here, as always, with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And today, we have an incredibly special guest, and that is Dr. Chad McIntosh. Dr. McIntosh got his PhD at Cornell. And if David Lewis is known as the man of many worlds, Chad McIntosh is known as the man of many theistic arguments. Uh, and so we'll get into that today. But Chad, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a real pleasure. So Tyler, you want to get us going? I know uh, yeah. a lot of yes. time. Time, so. So, so Chad has some pretty cool papers. He's got three and a uh, philosophy compass uh, on arguments for God's existence and just kind of surveying updated literature uh, uh, regarding that. And so but he, he breaks it down. He has one paper. This was the, the kind of original paper um, uh, on non-traditional arguments for God's existence. So uh, our viewers probably are familiar. I mean, we've done videos on like the argument for contingency, a couple of different videos with that, uh, with Pierce and Rasmussen and so forth. And, and I'm sure our, our, our listeners or viewers are, are familiar with like the Kalam cosmological argument or, um, you know, the, the, the uh, fine tuning uh, design arguments and so forth. But uh, Chad has an, an article that's it's looking at arguments that aren't that haven't been so uh, look, looked at um, that that, that uh, haven't been traditionally discussed in the literature as much as as, as the aforementioned arguments. Um, and so uh, and then after that, he's got a two part <laughs> um, uh uh, are, this two part, uh, what, what would you say? Like articles, two part series? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, a, it's, it's a, a, an article just surveying the traditional arguments. And it, it just ballooned so quickly that I petitioned the editor to do a, a two part deal. And, and uh, she agreed, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. So this is where you do look at the more, you know, moral arguments, contingency arguments, mm -hmm. uh, design arguments, and, and so forth. And so I figure we could just talk about that today, right? And and just kind of go into the papers. We'll we'll have the links to the papers um and and, and the video. But uh, I figure we could just, you know, go through this and 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 kind of talk about it a bit. But before we do that, before we do that, uh, I figure you could just tell us. Maybe maybe someone's not familiar with arguments for God's existence or theistic arguments. I figure you could just tell us what you think are, what, how would you define a theistic argument? And, and maybe you could even tell us what a successful theistic argument looks like. Well, a theistic argument, well, to begin, we have to define what theism is, right? Theism is just the view that there's a personal God like that worshiped by Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Uh, and, and so a theistic argument then is going to be any argument for the existence of a being like that with it with at least one godlike attribute like necessity uh, godlike power or knowledge uh, ground of morality creator or designer of the universe or natural world and and so on so that's that's what we mean by a theistic argument and then what about successful well, can, you, can you give me some insight to what would be a successful thesis i know there's yeah. a lot of literature on this but... that's a that's a trickier question because we we also need to back up and and sort of talk about what a what a successful philosophical argument is in general and that's it's a it's a highly debated sort of meta philosophical question and as a rule of thumb i, I think we can say that a good philosophical argument a successful philosophical argument is just one that a rational person can take seriously. And so when we come to theistic arguments, a good or a successful theistic argument is just going to be an argument for God's existence that a rational per person can take seriously. So okay. it doesn't, it's, 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 uh, it's valid. It doesn't uh, have any uh, formal fallacies or commit any formal fallacies like that or anything like that. Uh, and it, it's one that a rational person can take seriously. Okay, very good, very good. Um, well, let's let's get into your your article. So I, I, I'm interested in your non traditional, mm -hmm. um, your non traditional arguments paper, and not just because I'm cited in that, but because generally I, I find non traditional arguments uh, to be quite quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what, can you can you give us kind of like highlights of the article or perhaps tell us kind of what your favorite non-traditional arguments are? Yeah, so 
in my survey of the literature on theistic arguments, I think it, they can all sort of neatly been, be grouped into uh, different categories. So the traditional ones are like cosmological, ontological design, moral mer arguments from miracles, pragmatic arguments like Pascal's wager, and then just arguments from religious experience. But then the non-traditional side, we have metaphysical arguments like arguments uh, based on metaphysical entities and facts like propositions or abstract objects or things like that. We have nomological arguments, arguments from the laws of nature, the nature of the, the nature of laws of nature. Uh, axiological arguments. These would be arguments that are from non-moral kinds of value, like deontic de value, or uh, or uh, aesthetic arguments, for example, aesthetic value. Uh, noological arguments. These would be arguments from mind-related phenomena, mental phenomena, knowledge, consciousness. Uh, then we have linguistic arguments, pretty self-explanatory there, uh, arguments based on uh, facts about language and semantics. We have anthropological arguments, arguments from the meaning of life, desire, uh, things like that. Uh, and then we have meta arguments, so cumulative case style arguments. And, and my favorite category of the non-traditional arguments, I think would be noological. It, it would be from uh, mind related phenomena, in particular consciousness. I, I really like, I, I like the argument from consciousness. Can, can you uh, go through it? Yeah, so the main intuition here is that mind or, or consciousness is, is just more fundamental than matter. So well, actually, two kind of two lines of argument I like. The first is just it's, it's seeming impossibility that, that mind could be produced from matter. Matter just doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that can whip up anything but matter, right? Uh, you, you can only get matter from matter. But mind, on the other hand, is, is not only productive, but it's also creative. So it's much easier to see how mind could produce matter than, than the other way around. So that's kind of one line of, of thinking here for the argu argument from consciousness. But the one that I'm really fascinated by is, uh, it, it goes like this. F from a scientific perspective, things like colors and smells and flavors and textures of things these are not things in themselves. These are not features of things in themselves, but, but they're just aspects of how we perceive things, right? So the modern concept of an object ascribes nothing over and above geometrical properties and motions, uh, which, are, which are just extrinsic relational things, purely formal properties, uh, not things in themselves. The, 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 from a scientific perspective, uh, there is nothing basically uh, to an object in itself intrinsically. Think of, think of a blade of grass. Okay, you're probably thinking of something that's small, green, flimsy, uh, delicate, uh, and so on. But these are all properties that we perceive, right? These are all uh, sensible qualities, as, as Barclay would say. Uh, there, you can't really see these things under a microscope. Um, under my microscope, what you're going to find are arrangements of of atoms or molecules, which are arrangements of uh, other things, you know. It, it, so under under a microscope, all you're going to encounter, all you're going to see, are these sort of geometrical properties and relations, uh, and nothing. There's nothing going to be there that you could say that that's the blade of grass. That's what it is. Uh, it's always going to be. You're always going to be encountering things that are defined by other things. Um, but it seems absurd, though, to think that there's nothing in an object that is intrinsic to it. Uh, it's not like it, it can't just be relations all the way down, right? There has to be something intrinsic to an object. Uh, but the best candidate we have for something that's intrinsic, intrinsicality, is mind, is, is like a mental state. So if what gives objects intrinsicality, if what, if in order for an object to be something in itself, uh, there, you, eventually you bottom out in something mental, something mind-like. Well, it's going to be uh, only the mind of God could be uh, could serve that sort of role to ground the the intrinsicality of, of physical objects. Uh, so I, I think that's a really interesting argument. You're muted. Real quick, going back into the to the, um, the argument from consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, just I'm curious. Um, you know, if someone gives like a standard emergentist account, right, of consciousness, where um, the mind is uh, produced from 
uh, it emerges from complex physiological properties, right? In the same way you have like magnet, you have prop magnetic properties, just, you know, uh, in the right sort of way and a magnetic force field sort of, you know, comes from um, these complex properties and maybe the soul is something like that. What, what are your thoughts on that sort of response? Well, it's just a description of a view. It's not a description of how mind emerges that I mean, you could you could just describe emergentism as you just did, but that tells me nothing about how how mind actually emerges from from matter. Uh, so just simply describing the view doesn't get us anywhere into actually having a story, as they say, about how it works. So so the idea is emergentism can tell us like this possibly logically coherent story, but it has it, it, it's not giving us any sort of reason to prefer it over, say, some other account. Is that what, is that what you're getting at? No, I mean, just describing that mind emerges from matter that doesn't tell us how that works, right? It, it doesn't tell us the mechanism or the, the complete picture of, of how exactly mind is emerging from matter. And so until you give me that, then yeah, it's just a view that you could defend, I guess, but I, I have no reason to think that it's even possible. Okay, so you want more details. Uh, to, you want more of a story. Uh, and until, until then, you know, you're, you're not really gonna take it as a plausible alternative. Right, right. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, well, hey, let's let's uh, send it back over. I'll, I'll pass the ball over to Mike, and Mike can take the traditional arguments there. Yeah, Chad, this is um, what you're doing is so impressive, and we we talked about it a little bit before we hopped on. But um, you know, so like, yes, I'm working on my my PhD, working on the foreknowledge and freedom problem, and I ran into an issue yesterday that dealt with some epistemology, and so I I called up Tyler, and he starts getting into it, and all of a sudden, you know, it's off the rails into this deep epistemology, and I'm like man, you know, I gotta like, whoa, slow down. Like I need, like, I need to take some time and think about this. You're you, like, you've spoke on, you're dealing with all these arguments that, uh, and you're doing it at a, at a publishable high level, but you're dealing with philosophy of mind. Then you're moving to causation. Then you're moving, you know, into scientific theories. And uh, it's just really, really cool what you're doing. Really impressive. I, I you gotta tell me what your work schedule is like after this, because I don't know how you have the time to get all this done, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. okay. That's oh, one fun thing about theistic arguments is they are such a philosophical watershed. Yeah. Like every argument seems like it intersects in so many different areas of philosophy that it, it does, it, it doesn't get stale. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. No, no question. No question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like Tyler said, uh, I'm curious your thoughts. So what are your favorite traditional um, theistic arguments? Maybe you can take us through sort of your favorite one. Yeah. Uh, as sort of a preface to that. I guess I would say that I'm, I really like C. Stephen Evans's approach in his book, Natural Science and Knowledge of God. Yeah, that's a good book. Where, yes, it's fantastic. Well, he, he views the main theistic arguments, the traditional theistic arguments, as articulations of what he calls natural science, right, which are, are like raw intuitions or, or senses of God's existence based on things like, uh, in the world uh, or, or morality or, or things that just trigger a disposition in us to believe in God. And these raw intuitions are, 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 I think they're stronger actually than, than the actual articulations of the arguments themselves. Um, but uh, when it comes to the arguments, you know, I, I, I like versions of the cosmological, ontological design and, and moral arguments. Um, and uh, up until recently, I, you know, I wasn't a big fan of the arguments from miracles until I read uh, Craig Keener's multi-volume work on that, which is, which is just a tour de force. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool, um, but just to just for the cosmological argument, I would probably gravitate more toward you know the contingency argument. Uh, I, I think that the principle of sufficient reason, especially the broad one that just says everything that exists has an explanation, I think that's undeniable. I think denying that almost ventures into dishonesty. I mean, it's it's just so obvious to me. And once you grant that everything has an explanation, I mean, you have the resources there for, for a theistic argument. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, that's cool. And I, was, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry, but I, I also sort of, on the contrary to that, because I think it'd be helpful, uh, I know a lot of our listeners are working in philosophy, religion, apologetics. Are there any arguments out there that 
you sort of are disappointed with the state of these arguments right now that could use some more work and attention from, from philosophers. Obviously, I know you're doing that, but is there, you know, if you had a young apologist who's trying to figure out what, you know, what uh, arguments to advance, you know, to, to move the needle forward, what sort of uh, advice would you give that, that person? That's a good question. Um... I sprung it on you too, so we can totally cut this, <laughs> Chad, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's a good question. I think, uh, I would say a lot needs to be done on the so-called uh, problem of like symmetry for the ontological argument, mm -hmm. reasons, to, reasons to prefer the main premise, possibly God exists over its complement, uh, possibly God does not exist. So what reason do we have to think that God, God possibly exists? Uh, do we have more reason to think that's true than, than possibly God does not exist? I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on that. Uh, and otherwise, I think, I think the, a lot of the arguments, uh, the non-traditional arguments could be shored up. You know, so much attention is given to the traditional arguments that uh, the non-traditional arguments kind of get left to the wayside. And, and in particular, I think, I guess you could call it a sort of a, a version of the argument from consciousness. And William Paley has some uh, insightful remarks about this in his book, Na uh, Natural Theology. It, it's like the argument from pleasure, I guess. If, if there's an argument from evil, there's, there's gonna be an argument from like gratuitous pleasures. Like we don't have to enjoy food so much. We don't have to enjoy sex so much. We don't have to enjoy, uh, be, like think, you know, have all these uh, qualitative pleasures in life in order to survive. They seem to be sort of gratuitous add-ons that make life all the sweeter. I think, I think you could really develop an argument like that, that, uh, that would be interesting, yeah. So just one, thank you, Chad, just one second. We'll cut this, uh, just one second. Hey, hey how are you? good. good. You, are you okay? I need like 20 minutes uh, okay. to finish this up and then I'll, I can come out and help. No worries. They're, they're out there right now. Yeah, thank you, I'll be right out, thank you. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Okay, ready? Well, uh, and, and I'll have my guy cut it up so it'll look look fine. Um, Chad, sorry for springing that on you. I popped no worries. And then I'm like, that's, oh, that was a great question. Oh, it's like, okay, ready? Three, two, one. Yeah, that's great, Chad. That's that's a that's a great point. A lot of great points. Um, I'm curious. So our friend, the young Kripke, Joe Schmidt, responded on his. Uh, channel to your 100 theistic arguments. Um, and so uh -huh. I'm just wondering, did you get a chance to look at that? And do you have any, any sort of comments in response to, <laughs> to Joe's uh, stuff? Yeah, well, you know, it's, I think it was something like 10 or 12 hours long. So I, I didn't watch the whole thing, right? I don't think anybody, anyone watched the whole thing, but uh, okay. So honestly, I thought it was a bit, uh, I thought it was poor form uh, academic, by academic standards. Uh, especially what I've come to expect from Joe. You know, it's one thing to work, to do all the work of reading an author and presenting their argument as charitably as possible and, and, and combing through the literature as I did. Uh, and of course, even doing that, just presenting an author, the bare bones of an author's argument without defense as I did is risky because you risk not giving the author their due, right? Um, but my purpose in that, in, in the original capturing Christianity video, video was just to expose people to these arguments, not to defend them. So to then criticize an author without doing the work of reading them in detail, going through the literature like I, like I did, uh, and relying instead on my, my own bare bones outlines, I think, you know, that's a little unfair and academically lazy. It was beaten into me in, in, in undergrad that you have to earn the right to criticize. And I don't think Joe really earned the right to criticize a lot of those arguments uh, he, because uh, evidently he didn't read a lot of those papers. He was just coming up with criticisms on the cuff. And I, I, I think that's, that, that's academically lazy. Um, but uh, I, let me say one more thing about that is that he also said a lot of the arguments were just invalid. And what he, mean, what he meant by that, I think, is that they, he thinks a lot of them commit the informal fallacy of begging the question. But I think that's misleading. Joe knows that it's often extremely difficult to determine when an argument begs the question. And it's almost always debatable whether or not an argument begs the question. Uh, 
because informal fallacies are just so context sensitive. So to blast a bunch of the arguments as invalid as he did, I think is actually a little silly. So uh, I love Joe, God bless him. I don't want to sound too harsh uh, because I, I love his work, but uh, you know, that's why I'm judging him to maybe a higher standard than, than I would some of the other responses that I've seen. Okay, so one criticism that comes up a lot with um, traditional theistic arguments is the gap problem. So maybe can you explain what the gap problem is and your answer to it? Yeah, so notice that the arguments, even if they're successful, most of them get us to just a godlike being or, or a being with just one godlike attribute. So we can't really conclude from them, even if they're successful, that God exists, right? God, the object of, of religious devotion, worshiped by Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Uh, and so this is, this is known as the gap problem, right? There's a big difference or a gap between a first cause or a ground of morality, uh, which are just sort of theoretical postulates. There's a gap between that and, and, and the sort of theologically rich picture that we have of, of God. So what do we say in response to that? Well, the typical response is just that you can abductively sort of stitch together conclusions of many arguments uh, for a more theologically robust picture of God. And that's fine, uh, but I, I think we can actually say more. Um, so the gap problem, it's a real problem. It's a substantive problem, but it's also kind of a dialectical tactic that stacks the deck against theistic arguments. Uh, and and let, me, let me explain that a little bit. And it, what I want to say here is just that it would be unrealistic and unfair to require of a theistic argument that it established the existence of a being with the whole suite of divine attributes, right? Uh, for one thing, it's unclear what the whole suite of divine attributes are, uh, but more importantly, requiring that of a theistic arguments would force theistic arguments, force onto theistic arguments, a burden that's just too heavy for any reasonable argument to bear. Any argument purporting to establish a being with like all of the divine attributes, uh, especially like the Christian God in particular, it's not likely to enjoy the virtue of modesty, right? It's not going to be a very modest argument. Uh, and, and since mis modest arguments are easier to defend, uh, requiring that of theistic arguments would just impose such an immodest requirement on, on all of them that, uh, that basically none of them could be successfully defended. Uh, and, and here's a way of thinking about it. Nicholas Rescher, in one of his books, he, he points out that for any plausible claim, there's always going to be a trade-off between its evidential value or its evidential security or probability on the one hand and what he calls the, its contentful definiteness on the other. And, and what he means there is just like the claim's exactness, its detail, its precision, uh, how much content is really loaded into a claim. So there's a trade-off here. And he illustrates it with this graph. So the more content or the more increasingly definite a claim gets, the less secure it gets evidentially. So as a, as a claim, as you can see on the graph, as a claim increases in what he calls contentful definiteness, it decreases in evidential security. So if by God, we can only mean a being with like all the divine attributes, the whole suite of divine attributes, any argument for the claim, God exists, would be an argument for a claim very high in contentful definiteness and very low in evidential security. Uh, and so requiring theistic arguments to establish a being with the whole suite of divine attributes is just, uh, it, it will be very convenient uh, for the critic of theistic arguments, right? Because no argument would, would really ever establish that. Um, so there's actually something of a dilemma here then for, for theistic arguments. So if we're not gonna defend a claim that's very high in, in, uh, con in, in definiteness, contentful definiteness, well, then we got to narrow the meaning of God down, right? We got to narrow it down to just, a, a, like I said before, a being with at least one godlike attribute. Um, but then we face the gap problem again, right? So it's either high in contentful definiteness uh, and low in evidential security, or if it's narrow in contentful definiteness, well, then we face the gap problem and, and all the theistic arguments are, are, are basically non sequiturs. Uh, so how do we get out of this di dilemma? Well, I think the answer is that we got to, we should, and this goes to your other point, Michael, is uh, what arguments could f Christian philosophers be working more on? And it's uh, arguments that leave no gap, essentially. Uh, 
And in the literature, these, are, are, these arguments belong to a subclass of natural theology called ramified natural theology. And ramified natural theology shares the same methodology as natural theology generally, um, in, in that it only, they only appeal to reason and testimony. But there are arguments for not merely a godlike being, but the god of a specific theistic religion, such as Christianity. So the paradigm example would be arguments from miracles, uh, like the resurrection. Uh, the earliest Christians actually appealed more, more frequently to arguments from prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. Um, you know, and, and very interesting here would be, uh, it, you know, if you could show that the messianic prophecies of Isaiah, for example, are, are plausibly fulfilled by Jesus. I mean, that would be a very powerful argument, not just for theism, but for Christian theism over other versions of theism. So arguments of these kinds just don't face a gap problem. Um, now, apart from the sort of arguments from miracles just mentioned, there are some more general philosophical arguments that qualify as, as ramified arguments, I guess you could call them. And, and two of them, to, so just to give a few examples, um, Linda Zagzebski and John Hare have defended moral arguments that push more toward uh, a Christian conception of God. You know, they, they argue that uh, the only way to live up to the practical and rational demands of morality is if we had the assistance of not just a godlike being, but one more like the Christian God, one that offers assurance and guidance, grace, atonement, justification, sanctification, and, and, and these sorts of things. So there's a sort of a ramified moral argument. Now, the one that I like that I'm currently working on is just based on the PSR. I, I think we can get a lot of mileage out of the PSR, more than, than philosophers, I think, have, have recognized uh, or have realized traditionally. And uh, just very briefly, let me just sort of give a teaser of the argument. It'll be something like this. Um, okay, the PSR, everything has an explanation. Well, if that's true, well, then God also has an explanation, right? So what then is God's explanation? Well, it can't be anything external to God because God created everything external to God. So if he has an explanation at all, it must be something internal to God. Well, then you, what, what could that possibly be? Now, I know we probably differ on uh, the status of uh, simplicity among the divine attributes, but I think there's just no way to answer this question without denying simplicity. Uh, in fact, I think the best way to answer this, this question, what's God's explanation? It must be something internal. Well, let's just say it's his parts, right? God, God is explained by his parts. We explain the existence of things by appeal to their parts all the time. So why not, why not just say uh, God has parts as well? Well, okay. This just pushes the question back a bit, right? It just is because now we have to ask, well, what explains the parts? It can't be parts all the way down because, again, that just defers explanation indefinitely. It doesn't actually give you an explanation. And so I argue that the only way you can have an explanation of the parts is if they explain each other. But the only way that they can ex explain each other in a non-circular way is if there's at least three of them. Uh, that's a way to avoid sort of a vicious circularity problem. And by appeal to Occam's razor, we need uh, no more than three. And so the, by the PSR alone, we're, we're, we've pushed into the territory of not just a godlike being, but a tripartite god, a god with, with three parts. And uh, yes, there's still a little bit of a gap that remains there because you, I'm not identifying the parts as the persons of the Trinity or anything like that. But boy, that's a that's a that's a pretty big metaphysical coincidence, right? <laughs> that's really cool. That that's really cool. Yeah, they, it, <clears throat> my my kind of favorite approach is you know more epistemological. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I like simplicity, so uh, you know <laughs> your response no is offered to to, to me. But I, I do enjoy listening to it and thinking about it. But the sort of epistemological. Um, response that you know i've talked about in the literature is um that knowledge requires proper function and uh proper function plausibly i've argued for following planiga you know requires a designer or something like a designer um uh, responsible for our cognitive systems and and uh that um uh, can't you, know, you really don't have resources to talk about cognitive systems ultimately existing or designers or something like designers and a lot of the i'll say this traditional 
ways of understanding a lot of Eastern religious traditions. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so that, that kind of addresses, uh, sort of narrows our, our choices down. <laughs> and then if you think that our cognitive systems, uh, the design plans uh, need to, um, uh, in order to make sense of these, you know, we, we need a story that doesn't assume an actual infinite with respect to how these cognitive systems were formed. You know, then this might address Mormonism or typical traditional Hindu cosmology, even of the personalistic stripe, right? And so you, you can kind of like do this ramified natural theology as well through epistemology. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I really like the focus on ramified natural theology, and I do agree with you. It's it's really missing. Um, it could be a lot more could be done uh, yeah. in reference to it. So tell us uh, your website. Uh, I think you're working on a book right now. Feel free to kind of plug this in as we as we close. Yeah, so I'm just sort of slowly going, trying to trying to finish this book, uh, taking my time at a very leisurely pace. It, it's 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 a book defending the argument I just gave, uh, sort of sort of, sort of the tripartite God argument. Um, my website is camacintosh.com. Now there's two two sides to the website. There one is just that host my academic work, all my publications are up there, interviews and so forth. But then the other side of the page of the, of the web page is, is theistic arguments, uh, where I'm actually cataloging all of these theistic arguments. And I go into, and I, I, out, I outline the arguments uh, premise by premise. It's not done yet. I've only completed cosmological, ontological design, moral arguments, and arguments from miracles. Um, but I'm slowly uploading content, so check in there if you like that sort of stuff, and, and I have, uh, I think it's a pretty slick way of doing it with uh, drop-down menus and uh, resources you can click on, uh, so uh, yeah, you, if you want to check that out, uh, that's something I'm, I'm sort of working on on the daily. Yeah, it's really, really neat, and I look forward to you uh, uh, finishing up their project. It's a really cool resource that I hope lots of people utilize. Well, yeah. thanks Chad for coming on. And, uh, I hope you come on again in the future. And I don't know, maybe one day we can talk about whether or not aliens pose a existential threat to Christian, <laughs> yeah. Christian belief. Uh, very good. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for having me guys. It's a blast. Thanks Chad. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Blessings.